Hello everyone, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this really exciting panel event during Top Women in EV Week. How can women drive leadership and inspire change in the e-mobility industry in partnership with Wallbox Chargers? I'm really excited to be hosting this event as part of Top Women in EV, a week-long celebration of the women driving forward the e-mobility industry. We know that many areas of e-mobility are male dominated, but we hope that by highlighting and representing incredible women in, women in the sector, we can increase their visibility and help to propel gender balance in the industry. But beyond that, we want to try to create actionable change with this campaign. So this panel featured spotlight articles on electric drives plus video content will all be inspiring tools for women already in or hoping to get into EV. If you've missed any of that content so far, do check out the EV Summit LinkedIn page to stay up to date. I'm also thrilled to announce that this week we are launching a mentoring program for women in the sector and myself alongside a number of inspirational women featured in Top Women in EV, plus many of our speakers today from across all sectors of the industry have signed up to donate an hour of their time to women in search of advice and support. We'll be sending around an email following the event including a link to sign up as a mentee. So please share that with any women that could benefit from mentorship. Now, this event is really personal to me in particular. When I moved into the automotive industry 12 years ago, the gender balance was very different to what it is today. However, I was lucky enough to be guided by a senior female leader, herself quite alone in a male dominated environment. She was fierce, but fair and a true inspiration to me as well as other women and men around her. Personally, I've experienced challenges in this area, as well as fantastic opportunities. And it's great to see how many women are now working in automotive at all levels of seniority and areas of the industry. Ladies, you rock. We know there may still have been a long way to go before we reach gender parity in e-mobility, but we're hoping this event may get us one step closer. We've got a fantastic lineup of women speaking today who will be talking from their own personal experience and offering actionable insights into how we can help women in the industry step up to more senior roles and what needs to change in the industry to help us create a welcoming environment for women at every level. Our panel partner for this event is Wallbox Chargers. Wallbox is a global company that creates smart charging systems that combine in innovative technology with outstanding design and manage the communication between the vehicle and the charger. Wallbox currently commercializes solutions for residential and semi-public charging in more than 60 countries and employs over 500 people in Europe, Asia and the Americas. We're so pleased to have Wallbox as a partner as a company that champions diversity, believing a more diverse workforce is critical to transform not only the technology powering the sector, but also the relationship between brands and consumers. At Wallbox, the number of women in leadership positions has grown from four to 24 over the course of a year, representing a six times increase, which is just the beginning of a long-term journey. And now to introduce our excellent panel for today. We have with, we have with myself, Barbara Calixto, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Wallbox Chargers. We have Louise Hardman, who's Head of Marketing at, and Events at Polestar UK. Kelly Becker, who's President at Schneider Electric UK and Ireland. Maria Benson, Director at EY. Swama Ranathan, uh, Associate Partner at McKinsey and & Company, and Samantha Kay, Head of Clean Tech at Piper Maddox. We'll have the opportunity for a live Q&A with all of these fantastic speakers, so please do share your questions for them in the tab, um, the Q&A tab within Zoom. And you can do that anytime during the event. So now to introduce our first speaker on the panel today, Barbara Calixo, who is Chief Marketing Officer at Wallbox Chargers. Since 2019, Barbara has led Wallbox's global marketing and communication strategies, as well as managing a growing team of more than 20 strong marketeers. Over the course of just one year, Barbara has helped to increase the number of female leaders at Wallbox six times. So I've no doubt she'll give us some incredible insight into driving forward female leadership. So please do remember to send in your questions to Barbara using the Q&A tab just below. So Barbara, thank you for joining us today. To kick us off, could you tell us a little bit more about your professional story and how did you get to where you are today? 
Sure. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for um, for the intro. And um, hello, everyone who's connected. Thanks for, for joining us today. Um, so I before, well, as you said, I've been with Wallbox since 2019. It's a great story how I ended up meeting Enric, the, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Wallbox and ended up here. Um, going back a few a few years before that, my background is actually, I'm, I was born and raised in Brazil. And then um, I was working in the um, beverages industry in Brazil and then went to the US to get an MBA. And at that point I shifted my career to first merchandising, working in retail. And then from that, the next step was marketing. So I've been working with marketing for the past 10 years now. Um, and initially in technology companies um, in the US and then eventually moved to Spain to take on a global role leading the marketing team for a ride hailing company um, called Cabify. And that was how I entered the mobility um, um, sector. Well, Wallbox is a, a Barcelona-born company, and I met the, the um, co-founder of the company in 2017, no, 2018, um, and he was, he was seeing the work that we're doing at Cabify and said, well, I need someone to help build the, the Wallbox brand. Called me, we had some great conversations. It just wasn't the right moment at that point. Um, for me, um, professionally, I was still... Um, building some of the work that I had at Cabify and then here for Wallbox, um, we would, were just not fully aligned, but we stayed in touch. I believed in the project from the beginning. I think that one of the first things I realized when I was joining this sector is um, the electrification of the fleet is not only something that, that is going to happen, but it's something that should happen from, for, for a lot of um, aspects, right? Um, and the environmental benefits to it is one of them for sure, but not the only one. So um, I believed in the project from the beginning, and then it was just a matter of time for finding the, that right moment to join. Um, and then since then, I got the, the, the pleasure to build the marketing team here within uh, Wallbox. And we've been growing and just doing a lot of interesting work um, in this space. And it's been a very exciting journey so far. That's great. And also, how do you respond to kind of creating increasingly diverse customer audiences? Is that through your diverse leadership? Um, it has a lot to do with that, yes. So um, the theory that, that me and my team work with is, um, that's actually very interesting because we did a, a survey and we, we commissioned a study here at Wallbox that really validated a lot of these points. Um, it's interesting to think about the, the automotive industry is very male dominated, but the user base of the automotive industry is not, it's actually pretty diverse. It splits almost, almost evenly between men and women, right? So from a gender perspective, it's quite balanced. And yet the industry itself serving that audience, and we'll call this audience as marketing jargon, but think of that as the, the drivers, right? And the car owners, um, that is pretty balanced. And so uh, starting from that point, the, the thinking here is we now get the opportunity to, first of all, um, try to reflect more this balance that, that, that there is in the, in the user side of the automotive industry internally. And with that, we will slowly start breaking some of these self-fulfilling prophecies that are built into this, this um, system that has existed for so long. And the, the, the saying goes, well, first of all, by having more people working, not just in marketing, but in all areas of the company, more women will get their different point of view, will get their um, different way of uh, analyzing and, and understanding, and then therefore explaining and building things um, incorporated to the process. It also has the side effect of breaking this in other engineering, for instance, which is a sister industry and academic field of automotive that it's also male dominated, right? So because we have this, mo this movement where women are growing their participation in many fields, as, as you open up these opportunities, you just kind of start changing the dynamic from the inside out. So that is definitely one of the things that we've been doing. Um, and I think that the potential here is, is, is immense. I think that we can not only represent different points of view from a user base that is already diverse, but also by doing so, helping the adoption of EVs come from that diverse base, right? And we are, we're seeing this, but I think there's still room to, to improve. One of the things we found out with this study that we commissioned was that 42% um, of EV owners, um, we, we did this, it was a pretty comprehensive study done across nine countries. And on average, 42% of the EV owners, so people who currently own a, an EV, 42% are women. On the intender base, 45%.
And then when you analyze the causes why they haven't adopted EVs, um, you can see some, some, some things that kind of work together here. And we are just gonna, we're, by analyzing these, um, sorry, just a second. <laughs> sorry guys, I'm in the office. We had a, a, <laughs> a little um, drop by. Um, so when we look at the causes why they haven't, some of them have to do with, I don't understand the technology. I don't get the technology. Well, these are things that, you know, if we look at the automotive industry, um, it has been always like this, right? Like women go to the to the to car shop and it's like, well, are they telling me something that is correct? I don't know. We have to break this, like make the product simple so that we don't need to have a, a, an engineering degree to understand what you're saying, right? Make this, use data to show me what my car needs so that I don't have to be guessing if I'm being treated fairly or not by, by those. So I think there's an opportunity. That's why I talk about the, the relationship part. We, we can really build a more trust-based um, relationship by thinking about things differently, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with every word you're saying there. So thank you very much for that. So we're now just gonna take a look at questions. So um, we have actually had a question come in from the audience. Uh, let's see. So Barbara, do you think the consumer base of EVs has typically been mostly male as a reflection of the people working in the industry? Is this changing as the industry becomes more progressive? I guess you've, you've kind of said it then, but yeah, anything more to say on that? Um, well, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna repeat the points, but I right. do think it's, it's just one of those things where the, the user base is actually more diverse than the industry itself. Now, imagine what we can do and how much better the experience of this user base will be once we have this the, the same balance inside the industry as we have in the users. I think that we will enjoy our experiences much more. And then brands and their consumers will be much more closely tied. I see this as a huge opportunity that in which the user and the, in, in the industry will win by building these more aligned experiences. Yeah. Uh, we have some more. So um, often women are known for their organizational skills, but how do you avoid being pushed into an administrative or PA role when you're striving for a leadership position? Now, what a great question. Um, I think we, we have so many skills and like one of the, the traps we have to avoid here is let's not try to fit for people within um, roles or skill sets that are not necessarily coming intrinsically, but rather being a representation. One of the things that I work with the team here is if your best performers, like one way to see if you have an actual good strategy for, a di for building diversity in your work environment is look at your best performers. If all your best performers are the same profile of people demographically, not looking at just gender, that probably signals that your system is set up to incentivize those people to be successful and not others. If you are, if, if we assume that most people are capable, have and have been matched correctly to their jobs and their skills, they should feel comfortable and be able to perform well, right? So that's one cue. So taking this into this context, uh, a lot of times we see women um, going away, uh, moving away from positions that would be more tech oriented or, uh, you know, the, the hard skills oriented because those environments are male dominated and maybe harsh because there's no flexibility to manage their own professional lives with their own uh, family lives. So I think then, and then when we see the numbers and say, well, there's more women in administrative roles, well, they must be better at that. Well, not necessarily, right? So the, the way I think we can help as companies and as leaders, we can help that is um, make sure we're setting up a work uh, place that enables people to be successful in doing what they're good at and what they're, 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 and what they're interested in doing. And as a professional, um, make sure you're looking for companies that offer you. If you don't feel like administrative work is your thing, then look for a company that is willing to take your skills and your interests and let you, let them way, let you apply them in a way that works for you. Yeah, definitely. And also um, a part of that, you did touch on it lightly, but how can companies implement effective, flexible working to allow women to reach positions of leadership and have a family? Unfortunately, I think that that's, um, it took a global pandemic to get us to work, learn some of these things, right? We've been forced to. Um, but in addition to this, and, and obviously I think, God forbid, we need these things to, to, to show us how to do um, something that we should have been able to do um, 
18 months ago, right? Um, but I think that the sheer realization that we, as much as we have separate personal and, pro and, and professional lives, we are one and, and we'll have to make um, this work if for everyone, not just for women. Um, I see so many things going in the direction to, to change that. Um, but I think that the, the flexibility and the technology are better than ever to enable these things. And then just some will, you know, internal will and commitment to making this, I think that are super important from all parts. Eh? Like the more people commit to this and actually learn to work and deliver on their expectations. Um, and then the more companies enable and give the conditions for people to do so, the better this will work. And I think that many companies willingly or because we were forced to um, have been learning how to make this work lately for, for men and women alike. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I look forward to welcoming you back later on for our full, full panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks. So next up, let's, let's welcome Louise Hardman. Louise has been with Polestar, the electric performance car brand since 2019, as UK head of marketing and events, coming, however, from a background in FMCG. Louise, tell us a bit more about your journey and how you found the transition from FMCG to automotive. Yeah, um, to be honest, I think it was a really interesting experience and um, coming from a very different background around FMCG and then coming into an automotive industry, I think one of, I guess, the key things for me that I found um, people coming to me about is actually changing and going into a new industry, often there can be some level of self-doubt. And actually the one of the biggest, I guess, advice I can give is say yes to opportunities because actually the opportunities that I've had and I've said yes to, even when I probably felt a little bit more, I guess, nervous about taking on a new opportunity, especially when it's a new, in a new industry, I think actually have been the most rewarding. Um, and I think it's actually that level of ability to learn something new and what I found is bringing your experience and your skill set from previous industries, previous roles is what makes you unique, um, but also what makes you more successful in your role. And I think really tapping into those strengths and that previous experience is key. Would you say in that case, at any point, you think you may have experienced imposter syndrome? Yeah, to be honest, I think um, I probably experienced it. And I've also had a number of people come to me about accepting whether to accept new opportunities when they come to you if you don't maybe know everything about the role and I think unfortunately that is more prevalent in women and I think from kind of the experience that I've seen when you feel like maybe you don't have kind of a hundred percent of the experience to do a role that's often when that can come about but actually I think it's really about kind of understanding why you've been offered that opportunity because you've gone through a very stringent interview process and you know, you've clearly been identified as the best candidate. So really trust the people who have hired you for that position, trust your own experience and bring that to life is kind of the biggest advice I could give. Yeah, that sounds good. And it sounds like at times, you know, you said that you did have that self doubt, which, you know, is, is very difficult, but how did you then ultimately overcome that to become as successful as you are? Yeah, I can, I can give a few pieces of advice on that from my experience and I'd say, Firstly, make sure you say yes to opportunities um, and believe in yourself and have faith in your own ability. Um, and actually, I, I use that self-doubt more as a motivational driver. So actually turn that into a positive and don't be afraid to ask for some advice. So firstly, lean on those people who will give you kind of honest feedback, whether that be friends or family, but also seek role models. And I do have a lot of kind of role models and mentors that I turn to and actually kind of really speak to those people because they will give you kind of, they are more than willing to help and support you and give you the advice that you need. Um, so I'd say that's kind of the first one. I'd say, secondly, I've kind of already mentioned, but understand what your strengths are and your experience and then bring those to life. And that's something that I've really kind of found has helped. And what I think is women kind of makes us quite Kind of special in a way is that we have more of that emotional intelligence that we can really tap into and I've kind of used that to make sure I adapt my my style and my approach to different situations and to different audiences and I'd say don't underestimate the power of that because that really does help you completely push your leadership style into a different area and I'd say for me 
coming into a new industry, actually, um, it, it means that I can come with a different perspective and a different way of looking at things. And I think that's quite important when you're trying to disrupt and make change within the industry, because you can really challenge the status quo and think about what needs to change. Um, and I've definitely been able to do that within my role. Um, and I guess the only other piece of advice I'd say um, is make sure you're authentic and true to yourself. So I think often as women, we can often be asked to kind of be a certain type of leader or feel like we have to be a certain type of person to do well to be a leader. Honestly, I'd say be authentic and true to yourself because if you're 100% natural, that will not only help you when you're in more, I guess, stressful situations, but also that will really help you to become a much stronger leader by being completely honest to who you are. That's great advice. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for that. We have actually had some questions come in, so I'm just going to take a quick look now. Um, how, OK, this is a good one. How many of your role models and mentors were ladies? Actually, it's a mix. So um, I do have a couple of female leaders who I've really turned to more because I thought, what is it about them that actually I look up to? And what is it I think they are therefore role models in? And I kind of do steer to them more for, I guess, more advice in terms of approaching a certain situation. However, I do also have kind of a, a male kind of leader who I go to as well. And I think it's important to have a mixture, but I'd take that personally in terms of actually, who do you look up to? Why do you see them as a role model? And therefore reach out to them because I've often found that people will always be willing to give you advice and support based on their own experience. So don't be afraid to kind of reach out and ask for that advice. Thanks. Um, and we've got another one here. How, how do you differentiate between an opportunity that feels uncomfortable because it's a risk that will pay off and one that feels uncomfortable because it isn't right for you? I'd say believe, trust your own feeling because that's something I've really learned. If you have any, I guess if your thoughts are more around, do I have the skill set or the knowledge to know about this job? Actually, more often than not, you can kind of learn a lot of skills on the job. Um, and especially I've learned coming into automotive, I didn't know a lot of, I guess, the more basic technical knowledge, but you can learn that on the job quite easily. Um, you just ask other people and you learn that actually, if it's more, maybe you've got a niggle because you're not sure if the organization or the culture feels right for you, make sure that you actually believe in your own kind of feelings because that's really helped me. You know, yeah. there's a reason why you feel that way. Yeah. And as Polestar is a company, Scandinavian origin, how do you feel about the more equal split between parental leave in, in some of the Scandinavian countries? Do other countries like the UK and the US need to catch up? Do you think that shared parental leave would reduce the career gap between men and women? You know, I think it's a, a really interesting question. And I think now working, I've gone from working from American companies through to a Swedish company. And I'd say that that approach is actually really refreshing. And I hope that we can look at it and I guess reflect on it because I do, I do see that we as a company do have more of that gender balance, but also we have more of that work-life balance in terms of just the mentality around a healthier lifestyle and looking at things like parental leave and making sure that actually you spend quality time with the people you should be. And I think I'd like to see more companies kind of look at that because I think the Swedish mentality is something that I actually really kind of value. Yeah, me too. I think we've got time for just one more quick one. Um, what words of wisdom would you share with younger people that you wish you'd known when you were early in your career? The biggest advice, as I say, believe in yourself and have that faith because um, I think I've kind of gone through my experience and I've actually realised that actually having that faith and that belief that you can do something is so important. And if for some reason you suddenly lack a confidence or you don't feel like you're maybe being able to be yourself within an organization actually it, it may not just be you it may actually be the culture of that organization isn't the right fit for you so don't take things too I guess internally actually ask for advice and lean on other people and figure out what is right for you and what how you're able to be the best person that you are and definitely lean on others for advice because the best way I've been able to get through my career is by asking for advice and that's how I've developed and grown. It's great advice. Thank you, Louise. It's been great to have you here. 
Um, and we'll see you a little bit later on when we come back for the discussion with all of our speakers today. Next up, I'm delighted to welcome Kelly Becker, Schneider Electric's UK and Ireland president. Kelly has been at Schneider Electric for nearly 10 years, leading the business across the globe with a focus on strategy and business execution. Kelly, welcome. It's fantastic to have you here. Uh, once again, everybody, please do send your questions in, in for Kelly using the Q&A tab, getting some really good conversations going here. So Kelly, could you please start off by telling us briefly about your career journey? Sure, thanks Michelle for having me. Um, so I actually started my uh, career in sales right out of university. Um, frankly, took the highest paying job that I got. It just so happened to be um, a predecessor company that Schneider eventually bought. I sold large scale energy conservation projects to universities and school districts in the US. And then progressively grew into that, um, left the working world for a couple of years to get my MBA full time, uh, spent time working um, both in product management as well as strategy roles before really moving in to run businesses, which is what I've been doing for the last um, seven or eight years. Um, as you mentioned, I'm running our UK and I business since January of this year. And prior to that, I spent two years in Dublin running our Irish business. That's amazing. And what would what um, how would you explain women in leadership? You know, how how do you actually get there? <laughs> um, I think everybody's path is different. And, and that's actually what's really exciting to be on a panel with ladies like this is is what you'll see is that all of our careers are quite different. Um, for me, actually starting in a commercial role was excellent because um, so much of what I focus on now is what do our customers in fact need? How do we make their experiences better? You know, are we ensuring that we're delivering an experience as well as products that, that serve what they're looking to buy? Um, but honestly, I think for me, it's come in a couple of different ways. Um, I've always taken jobs that I expected to be excellent at. So if I was going to do a job, I was going to do it well. I was going to put in the hours. I would put in the time. Um, I also took a number of roles through the years that, that maybe other people would have seen as risky. Um, so a business that I ran in the U.S. at one point was a turnaround, which means it, it needed a completely new approach to how we went to market, how the team worked together, um, some of our people that, you know, didn't fit for the growth strategy or weren't really ready to, to go where we were trying to go. And at the time I took that role, you know, I think a lot of people said, oh gosh, who wants that job? But in fact, it was the best job I could have got, I could have taken because I got to make it my own. And I think those kinds of roles are exceptionally interesting. So honestly, I've, um, I've, I've sort of done so many different things to get where I am. I think when you look back on your career, we all pretend like it was planned in the way that it that has come about. But in fact, for me, I took roles in which I just built different blocks of information and knowledge. Um, that's what's gotten me here. Sounds like you've nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to diversity and inclusion, why should that now be top of our agenda when it comes to hiring future talent? Well, because diverse teams serve their customers better, ultimately. And, you know, I'm a big believer, Michelle, in a meritocracy. So the best person gets the job um, in my organization. However, um, you know, ultimately, diversity of gender is only one component of this. Diversity of background, diversity of geographical background, um, diverse educations, diverse experiences are what I'm really looking at. And so for me, it's because our customer base is getting more, more and more diverse as, as Barbara talked about initially, we need to look like our customer base. We need to reflect the people that are buying and making those decisions as well. Um, and I think so many different backgrounds and experiences um, create a team that's far more dynamic than the same person, you know, times 10 or times 20 in the room. Um, and so for me, it's diversity for me is such a broad topic. We talk a lot about it certainly being men and women, um, but it's so much bigger than that, I think, at this point. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. So we have actually had some questions. So I'm going to dive right in because we've got a few here. Um, OK, so how has it been to work in sales across different countries? How did you prepare yourself? 
what were your challenges and how did you navigate through them? Um, so I think sales is one of the best ways you can actually spend time in your career, whether you naturally believe that's where you should be or not, because um, figuring out how to deal with so many different types of people is what um, makes me good at my job today. So what I learned at 22, which was I could present to the president of a university and I could talk to the maintenance person working on our equipment, right? Different conversations, valuable in the same way, but, but I do that today as well, um, quite regularly across our entire organization and externally. And so sales for me is, is such an interesting way to build, uh, it builds resilience because you get told no a lot. <laughs> Um, and you have to, you know, sort of convince yourself that you're going to show up the next day, even when you've had a hard day. Um, but really, you know, people are people and they want to deal with people they like. They want to deal with people that bring something interesting to the table. And so I think if if people can get an opportunity to spend time in sales or external facing roles within companies, it's really valuable in your career. Yeah, that's really good advice. Actually, somebody else has asked um, was sales an intimidating environment to be in as a woman? Um, I think it probably was, but honestly, my personality is enough that, like I said, I like to win. You have to like to win if you're going to be in sales. You have to like to be the best at what you're trying to do. Um, and and my training class at the time was, you know, another woman and, and myself and the rest were men. Um, and guess what? The two women sold projects first. We, we, we um, because we approached it differently. I think yes, we we did. And um, and she's honestly one of my closest friends still. Twenty years later, because you bond as well when you're in that sort of environment. So I think there are so many successful salespeople, um, regardless of gender, regardless of background. But you have to make it your own. And I think that's what's really important. How are you successful in what you're doing? sales and frankly any other um, portion of your career yeah you're right um okay uh, another one how would you deal with colleagues who don't actually share your values of equality how would you suggest people early in their career handle those tricky situations so i have always believed and this comes from the way i was raised and and my parents that you have to live by your ethical standards always um, and it's, and it's, if, when you start to give those things away, uh, it takes away from who you are and, and it's sort of painful internally actually. And so, um, you know, not everybody's always going to agree with you. Not everybody may have been raised to the same way. Um, and so I think you have to know what you stand for and, and you can't be shy about that. You can do it in a very polite manner. Um, but it can be hard, especially early in your career when you're junior and what you're doing to stand up for what you think is important. But the minute you start to let your values be influenced by others, then your values don't matter anymore. And I think that's what you have to, to really remember always. Is this something I can live with um, or is this a non-negotiable for me? Yeah, stay true to yourself. Exactly. We've actually had uh, a question here. So it's from somebody that used to work at Schneider Electric. Hmm. They thought it was a great company for championing women. Uh, and they would uh, they would be interested to hear, now that you're leading the business in the UK, coming from Ireland, is there anything to learn from Ireland that you, you are now gonna bring across to the UK, us being very close neighbors? Um, so our business in Ireland was much smaller than it is in the UK. And so the team actually worked closer together than our UK teams just because of size. Yeah. And so we have been in the UK um, trying to ensure people have community, which is a really important component, which we had in our Irish business and built because of the size. And so what we're focusing on in the UK now is how do you create different types of communities for employees? within the company based on things that are important to them. Um, and that's probably one of the things that we've taken. So, you know, obviously I worked in our US business, which is enormous and that was a challenge. And so that was probably one of the biggest things I actually learned from the Irish business was um, fitting in is important and having a place where you feel comfortable is really important. And how do you create that in a much larger environment? Okay, I think we've got time for one more. So um, 
and this this is kind of leads on from that actually so how do you ensure the importance and benefits of a diverse workforce is fully understood across the organization it's a really hard one it's a it's a stump one quite frankly um something we're constantly talking about and and really working through you know i don't believe in a zero sum game i don't believe that because women are getting opportunities that that means there are less opportunities for men. I, I just don't buy into that um, dialogue that is certainly out there in the world right now. Um, like I said, I believe in a meritocracy. The best people will get the jobs because that's what's right for their company and that's what's right for our customers. And I think that's the conversation we have to have that this is about high performance culture. This is about delivering for your colleagues and for our people and the best people will get the jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, I'm, I'm never going to put someone into a role that I don't think can do the job, um, simply because of gender diversity or diversity of a different type of background that we've talked about. That's, that's not going to happen. People are going to get the job because they deserve the job or because they bring something different to the job. And so what I would say to everybody is understanding your own unique qualities is really important. Don't put yourself in the same bucket as other people. What do you bring to a job or to a company that's different? And be capable of talking about that because that's in fact incredibly important. Thank you, Kelly. Really Thank looking you. forward to hearing from you again a little bit later on at the end of the panel. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next up, we have Maria Benson, Director at EY. Maria is EY's UK lead for electric vehicles focused on advising clients engaged in the energy transition, including renewable energy, energy storage, and electric vehicles. Once again, if you've got questions for Maria, please post them in the Q&A tab, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the time. So Maria, you've had a varied career. Tell us a bit about how you got to where you are today. Hi, Michelle. Yeah, um, I actually started out in uh, automotive, so I think it's similar to yourself there. <laughs> uh, a long time ago now, uh, <laughs> and and I think as you've said, and as uh, several other panelists have said, it, that's a very male-dominated business. And to be honest, at the time, I didn't quite reflect on how male-dominated it was. So a lot of times, you just find yourself kind of going with the flow and trying to reach into people and, and kind of follow the conversations that when I look back were very sort of male oriented, but you just kind of go with it. Um, from there, I moved into uh, m and which uh, equally was very male dominated. Um, so I worked, I worked in that for a while as well. And I think, you know, for me, there wasn't much of a, of a progression there in terms of how I felt about women roles and, and especially around senior women. Um, I moved over to EY about seven years ago now, and I, I think, you know, it's probably a sign of the times, but also EY being a very, um, actually really good at focusing on, on diversity. So what's really become evident to me in these last seven years is that there's so much we can do, and if we actively focus on it, um, you know, we can, we can make a lot of progress around uh, you know, diversity and equality. And actually looking back at those, those other companies I worked for, there was no real reason why it was that way. It was that just no one really gave it, you know, the, the attention um, that, that it required. And so as a, sorry, as I was just gonna say, as, as at EY, I feel like, you know, there's so much more support for, for female leadership. That's great, that's really good. And presumably, this should be more than a just a kind of box ticking exercise, having just one woman on the team. You know, what's what's your view in terms of the kind of notion of having female representation in teams? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a really good point. I mean, for me, I think we are still in a position. I think we've, we've got over the point. I think someone else has mentioned it previously that we've got over that point where we're questioning whether diversity is a good thing. We all know that there's a lot of research out there. You can put, uh, you know, point to a lot of data points actually where you know diverse teams just perform better. So I think everyone agrees on that. But then the next question is, how do we get there? And I think there is still a notion that you know on every team there should be a female representative, and it's it's better than not having any females at all. 
but for me, you know, the 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 sort of the sign of success would be when we don't actually need to worry about that anymore, and that the team is naturally diverse. Um, but for now, I think you know, it's it's a good start. But the quicker we can get into a situation where we don't treat females or any other minority as a sort of representative, but just they're naturally on teams because um, they have a, a seat at the table and, and they, they sort of uh, um, deserve to be there. Yeah. And you're advising clients currently going through the energy transition. I know a lot of the other panelists have said that, you know, it's really important because we need uh, the reflection of our end customer, you know, should be exactly the same. We have uh, diversity across all of these subgroups. How does that play out in what you do with when you're speaking with customers? No, I think it's really important, especially uh, for me, uh, being a consultant, it's, it's really difficult to work as an advisor for, for um, clients or companies um, if they feel that we don't quite represent um, how their, you know, what they te their team looks like mm -hmm. and what they might be coming from. So as we discussed, uh, some of the other panelists discussed earlier around, you know, who's actually buying electric vehicles, who's who's the market, so to speak, um, you know, that that reflection of that on our teams as well is, is so important. Thank you. So let's take a quick look at the Q&A. We've got some questions here. Um, how has your interview process adapted to encourage diversity? Um, my interview process, was that? Uh, yeah, that was the question. Um, so if, if that, that recruitment, that, how the recruitment process may be yeah, overall. No, absolutely, absolutely. No, it's a good, it's a good question. So I think um, we've definitely, as a, as a company, started looking at, um, or we have for a while, looked at different points of view because we're all individuals, but there are certain behaviors that are perhaps more prevalent in women than in men. And I think it was mentioned by an earlier panelist, for example, you know, women perhaps are uh, less willing to, to sort of promote themselves or putting themselves up for a role that maybe they think is a stretch. Or, uh, you know, I think one of the questions earlier was around, you know, if women are very good at organizing things, maybe we get stuck in that role. Mm. So all of that stuff we need to be aware of. And so when I, um, so coming to the interview question, when I do interview people, I try to get behind all of that mm. and, and really see the individual. Yeah, that's great. And actually we have another question that sort of leads on from that. And it's all down to kind of being assertive. So how did you build your assertion skills? And um, would you say assertion looks different in men and women? I definitely think so. I mean, I remember uh, it's luckily, I think that's going away. But I mean, there was a time when an assertive woman was, was kind of frowned upon, whereas an assertive mm -hmm. man was looked at as a big leader, right? Which is horrible. It's really, really horrible. I think we've we've luckily we've we've we're bigger than that now. We we know that's not the case anymore. Uh, and for me, I think I think uh, Kelly mentioned that actually with their upbringing. You know, having parents who believe in believe in you, having you know the social network that believes in you. That that that's really important, and that, that's been really important for me as well. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. Um. Okay, so we've got some more here. Um, this is an interesting one, being in the position that you're in. What do you think is the biggest challenge for women in leadership positions? I think there's a few things. So one of them um, is this, this thing around, you know, when there are not a lot of females around, how do you, how do you create that social network and the, um, and the sort of support network that you need at that level? Because any leadership role, um, you know, there are times when you probably feel a bit alone and you feel like the decision is all up to you. And so most of us do need that support network. And you know, the more of you there are, the, the more of a community you can you can create. But if if you're the only female, I think that's a very exposed position to be in. Yeah. And, and actually we have another question that, that does lead on to that. Um, do you think you've run a team differently to how you've been managed by a man? 
and does this affect team morale and output? Yeah, I mean, I think there are certain things that I probably do look at differently than Iran would, and it's around the sort of the, the well-being of the team, the the point that you know it's not always the one who speaks the loudest or speaks the most that necessarily has the best ideas. So that you know collaborative approach, I think, is, is definitely something I try to follow. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. We'll see you again for the discussion a little bit later with the rest of the panel. Thank you, Michelle. Now I'm delighted to welcome Swarma Ramanathan, Associate Partner at McKinsey & Company. Swarna focuses on trends in the future of mobility, helping global companies develop new business opportunities, leading workshops and improving efficiencies in the automotive and energy sectors. Swarna, your background is in car design and engineering. What led you to end up in your current role? Hi, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks for having me and hosting such an interesting panel. I've been very keenly listening to everybody else. Fantastic. Um, so how did I land up what I'm doing right now? I'm a mechanical engineer by background and um, naturally I went into the automotive sector. I um, worked for General Motors for a very long time in India and in international positions in Germany and Sweden, etc. And, um, and I was a car designer, like you said, like, you know, more into uh, engineering and manufacturing um, uh, vehicles. And uh, what led me here was mainly my um, role in um, my, doing my MBA. And then uh, I changed my careers into um, consulting um, and then joined uh, McKinsey um, in about seven, eight years ago. And since then I've been working in consulting, mainly focused on automotive um, sector. Wow. And I should say also, please, anybody that's got any questions for Swana, please put them in the Q&A. This already sounds like she's had a very interesting career. So please, uh, yeah, offer those ahead. So Swana, you know, we've heard it from some of the others, but for you, why does diversity matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so many of our you know, co-panelists have already mentioned uh, diversity matters because, you know, it, uh, it improves creativity, it improves the morale of the team, it brings in innovativeness, etc. It does a different voice in the room, etc. So lots of different uh, reasons um, to bring more diverse teams. But there is also a business case for it. I mean, um, we in McKinsey, we run... Um, um, you know, an annual survey with more than 300 companies with more than 40,000 to 3,000 participants asking specific questions um, around diversity. And we've seen, you know, places where you've got 30% plus women in leadership positions or in executive positions easily outperform other companies in um, profitability, in performance, in business performance, where you just find women in leadership positions within 10 to 30 percent. So there is a clear business case and there is a clear um, research around it. Which proves yeah. that diversity is really important on top of all the soft, uh, soft elements that we all have spoken to already. Yeah. And what do you think organizations could do to win through diversity and inclusion? Yeah, so um, I think uh, just repeating the point to say that I think it's not anymore a question on whether it is uh, needed or not. It's just a question of how do you get there? And I think uh, one of my previous uh, speakers also said the same thing. There are a few things uh, which, uh, you know, very concretely companies can do, I think. One is having a, giving the accountability to managers and to executives to make sure that they are uh, looking into diversity with a very specific angle, right? So like, give them the accountability to have more women, not just gender diversity, but across all other sectors as well, giving them accountability. Second, secondly, um, promote, promote that openness and tackle this question on the head. It's like, if, you, if you're not able to recruit more women, if you're not able to retain more women, tackle that question on the head to say, what, 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 why is it so? What should we change? Instead of uh, putting it under the carpet and just paying lip service. Thirdly, I think um, there's a lot we as leaders could do in the sector, in organizations, because we have official systems of promotions, um, you know, attrition level, there are systems and tracking mechanisms which, in the HR, which, you know, we can enable equality by giving a little bit more focus on all the systems that we have. And I think lastly, we should just uh, make sure that we foster an environment of belonging and uh, make sure that there is support network, which I think Maria was just mentioning. 
all through the levels, not just in the entry level, but also in every level, make sure that that support network is there for women and uh, particularly tackle the challenges that women would um, have in any kind of a professional uh, environment. Yeah. So the different things that companies can tactically do, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that you're a big believer in having a role model. And why, why do you think it's so important to have a female role model? It is so important. You're right. I'm a big believer of that. And um, um, it's just that in my career, through my career in the last 15, 20 years, I have been always looking up to uh, women and uh, sometimes within the company that I'm in or sometimes outside the company that I'm in, but in the sector, right? So always within the automotive sector. And uh, it's um, when I was working for General Motors, it wasn't Mary there. It was a man. <laughs> Um, when I came out of General Motors, it was me. It was like, wow, fantastic to see a woman yeah. CEO take the reins of such a large company in the yeah. world. Right? It's just that, and it just installs the belief in you that, yes, it's possible. And yeah. I look up to it to say like, yes, I can be like that one day. Right? That's in the world of automotive. I think we just need more role models to make sure that, you know, people can look up to them and see that there is a path there that you can, you can um, grow up uh, and you can actually become one of those leaders in this sector. Other sectors have it more so than yeah. automotive, as we all know, and we just need to have more such role models in um, in the auto sector, I think. So it's up to you to be the role model right now. I try to be. <laughs> it's all my panelists here. We've got a fantastic panel of women here. All, all of them are role models, I guess. Absolutely. OK, so let's take a look at some questions that we've had to come in. Uh, OK, here we go. If you had to live your career again, what would you do differently or what would you keep the same? I wouldn't do anything different. I totally love the fact that I entered the automotive sector. <coughs> it was um, when I uh, left university, it was always um, you know, fashionable to join IT in India and join you know, one of the um, uh, tech joints, even if you had a mechanical uh, engineering degree. Wow. And I'm incredibly proud and I'm incredibly um, happy that I actually chose my career in the automotive sector and the way I maneuver different things I wouldn't change anything to be honest that's great that's you've had a you've had a great career um okay I'm actually here as well on from there um as a woman of color what were your primary challenges and how did you navigate through them in relation to that yeah um so in certain instances I mean I have I should say that I haven't been particularly challenged with being a woman of color However, um, what I can think of is um, overcoming that challenge with um, content analysis that you can actually talk through and uh, back up yourself in terms of what you speak and how you speak, rather than focusing on the appearance or the skin color, et cetera, right? So just give more focus on the content side of things, I would say, um, rather than appearance. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, okay, let's see what else we've got. This is quite an interesting one. Mm -hmm. We would. I would like to know if you have observed improvement in female car designers and making cars look more feminine. Very, very interesting question. So when I was uh, in the in the automotive sector, not consulting, um, again, I think most of us would recognize who are from the auto sector. Women are mostly car in designing, mostly in um, color and trim, and working on materials. There are a few women in the sector, I would still think, who are not in um, you know, aesthetic design, who are not doing the car design, but it's more on color and trim and materials and look and feel because they think we, we are better tuned to colors and uh, materials. I think we should just change that paradigm, right? We have to change, it's not changed yet. Um, still, I see a lot of my car design friends are all mostly men <laughs> from uh, the sector, but uh, very few women who actually do uh, exterior design or you know, interior design more so on color and trim. So yeah, I wouldn't yeah. think we have, we have a long way to go there, I guess, still. <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, so and also here, what do you think we can do to make sure female role models are more visible for the next generation? So you know, to be honest, I mean, panels like this help a lot yeah. to reach out uh, to um, you know, a diverse variety of people, right? Because you're not confined to just your own organization, but social media and panels like this help a lot. Um, and uh, within your organization, of course, we can install sponsorship uh, programs and mentor and mentorship programs, right? So those would um, enable role models to be appearing in a more um, open environment. But I, I do think 
especially in our sector where we see less and less role models within the organization, we have to open up cross companies to see how people can help each other and role models appear more on social media or conferences and open platforms. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, here we go. Sometimes feminine qualities are defined as just soft, kind, etc. What policies would you love to be redefined as feminine? Well, those policies are super important to be soft. Yeah. Kind. They have to be important and uh, I, I think we shouldn't um, discard them as feminine. I think they are really important in a team environment to be kind and to be caring and uh, to be nurturing others. Um, but again, apart from that, being assertive, being assertive of what you believe in and um, bringing in um, you know, your uh, facts and backups to just stand behind yourself is very important. It's equally important as caring and being nurturing, I guess. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Swama. It's been fantastic. We'll bring you back very soon when we do our full panel discussion. Thank you, Michelle. So last but not least, we have Samantha Kay. Samantha is an experienced headhunter and recruitment leader within e-mobility at Piper Maddox. Samantha leads the clean tech division and manages a team of consultants that recruit into e-mobility, autonomous driving and grid edge. Hi, Samantha. So as, bringing, as someone bringing people into the e-mobility industry, have you seen any parallels between some of the female clients journeys that, that you've witnessed and your own career? Absolutely. Um, and first of all, yes, just thanks for having me. Um, it's been a really great panel discussion so far. Um, I think recruitment, first and foremost, as an industry is extremely male dominated. Um, and I think that diversity and inclusion is something that I as a recruiter am really passionate about because it's something that I feel I can have a direct impact on on behalf of my clients. Ultimately, my clients are the ones who decide who they want to hire, but that comes from a short list of who we present to them. And so we truly believe that if we haven't provided them with a diverse or gender balanced shortlist, then we've not really put them in the best position to build a diverse workforce. Mm. Um, and then I think for, yeah, for myself personally, I've been really, really fortunate since building out our e-mobility division in 2017 to have worked with some amazing futuristic and innovative clients and also internally to fit to have been afforded this opportunity um, at the company that I work for and I've been for the past six years. Um, but ultimately being female and with less than a decade of experience under my belt, I've definitely been on the receiving end of some gender and perhaps age bias comments. <laughs> Uh, one company in particular just this year um, told me on a video call whilst on paper my expertise and my firm's reputation was best in the market. Uh, they were really concerned that their senior stakeholders wouldn't buy into my capabilities because I look so young. Um, which, yeah, it's, that maybe it's shocking that that's still happening, maybe not. Um, but because of this, it really is, um, and I'm, I'm trying to make it my mission to use my role to drive that gender balance forward uh, within the e-mobility industry. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's true. We need this at all levels, you know, from, from entry level right the way up. And you mentioned some interesting challenges there. Could you tell us a little bit about your own career journey? Yeah, sure. So I've actually been in recruitment for my whole career to date. Um, started out in executive search. Um, and uh, since joining the LHI group, which is the parent company of Piper Maddox, um, I spent the first two years in technology recruitment um, in the UK. Um, and that was really enjoyable, uh, but the market was quite saturated. And I was definitely looking to move abroad uh, to broaden my horizons. And yeah, really passionate about finding an industry um, that was perhaps a little bit more untapped. Um, at which point the opportunity with Piper Maddox, which is our newest brand, uh, we only established in 2015, uh, an opportunity came up um, to build out the e-mobility division. And my head of Piper Maddox was looking for somebody, um, ideally who already existed in the business, um, to make that transition as easy as possible. Um, we were really successful at the time in wind, solar and energy storage, but we had 
no industry co connections or, or or really and truly I don't think we had too much of an understanding of what e-mobility was or what e-mobility was going to be um, so that was my role when I moved to New York to, to sort of try and figure out and um, yeah by no means um, was that a difficult transition at all um, because yeah by 2017 it was starting on the cusp of disruption and I actually found it very, very easy to build out my network within e-mobility um, and start adding some real tremendous value to some of our clients because we were one of the first mm. um, to say that we solely specialize in this space. Um, and yeah, it, it our proposition um, was and, and still is really compelling. That's amazing. Thank you. And I should say, anybody with a question for Samantha, like you've been doing, please put it in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll we'll hopefully get to it a little bit later. So also, Samantha, being in, being in recruitment, how do you kind of have a, this focus and ensure that there's fair recruitment processes? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And I think it's something that we need to strive for internally, like internally at Piper Maddox, as well as on behalf of our clients. Um, so, yeah, Barbara, our first speaker mentioned, you know, um, women are such a key consumer segment in all sectors of the economy and um 80 percent of all household car decisions are actually influenced by women yet they only account for less than a quarter of the workforce within automotive um and so i think that there are so many things um that can be done to help drive fairer recruitment processes i think internally you know we have our own DNI placement ratio targets that you know have nothing to do with our clients' objectives. Mm. Um, but the I guess to talk about some practical examples, you know, gender analytics tools for job descriptions and job adverts, if you're not using an external recruiter, um, I certainly think are not going to do any harm whatsoever. And I think are an important tool. Um, you've probably all heard the statistic that men apply for a job when they meet 60% of the qualifications but women only apply when they meet 100% of the qualifications. So it's certainly something to bear in mind. Um, I've also talked about with various clients, you know, that have specific gender diversity objectives, um, you know, anonymizing resume submissions. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be really careful. We can't only present a certain category of candidate mm -hmm. as that would be positive discrimination. Yeah. Uh, you know, things like making sure that senior female involvement in an interview process, in addition to that HR screen, um, is, is at the forefront of our clients' minds. But it starts from us, as I mentioned, in the recruitment process. Um, we have to be fair and, and, you know, be forward thinking in the way that we want to, you know, attack diversity um, and be an extension of our clients' diversity objectives as well as our own. That's great. Thank you. So we've got some questions. I'm going to dive right in here for you. Um, first one, do less women apply for senior roles? If women aren't applying for the jobs, how can they be encouraged to apply or, or be recruited? Yes, it's a really good question. I think, you know, it varies. So we're industry focused, yet we recruit across all different business functions. So on the commercial side and sales and business development, um, you know, this year we probably place more female than men, uh, which is something that we're quite proud of. <laughs> um, but on the engineering side, which, you know, clients typically tend to use us where they need us the most, and that's often with some of the really super technical tools to build skill sets. Yeah, the fact of the matter is that, yeah, there are less women out there and therefore by extension less females apply. Um, in terms of, you know, what we can try and do to, to, to combat that, I think, it's really, really important that our hiring managers, um, you know, are brave enough to talk about their desire. Um, you know, hopefully when hiring, they're already partnering with a headhunter who's passionate about diversity objectives. But, you know, sometimes we find they're afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the more we know about their objectives, the more that we can do to help. Um, so, yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, another one here asking for your advice. Is there an ideal time to stay in a role so that it looks good on a CV? 20 years ago, managers frowned at moving roles every two years. But even as a manager, this often feels the best length of time to learn, develop and then move on. 
It's a really good question. <laughs> and a lot of people ask me this question. Uh, I think gone are the days where, you know, to be a, a, a life for a certain company is, is actually desirable. We still have different mindsets across the industry. I think um, so I'm based in the US in the Bay Area, less than two years at any company, you know, no eyebrow would be raised. Wow. Um, and the industry is moving so, so quickly. But I would say anything less than two year tenure should have an explanation, not necessarily into detail of what happened, but, you know, some rationale behind why you decided to make a move away from that after, you know, less than two years. Um, I would say, particularly in e-mobility, as long as you're staying at companies for more than two years, then I don't think you would be perceived to be jumping around. No, that's good. Good advice. Thank you. Um, when you were explaining your kind of experiences before, uh, somebody's got a question on that. So they said, when you were told you're too young, uh, how did you tackle that as an issue that you obviously couldn't change? Did it make you more determined to prove those people wrong? So it definitely made me more determined, particularly because he caveated it by saying on paper, we seemed like the best firm um, to, to partner with said anonymous business. Um, and my reaction immediately was to laugh it off um, and say, wow, I've, I've never had that before. But yeah, it, it really disappointed me and maybe, dare I say, angered me a little. Um, we don't actually, we, we didn't actually win that piece of work, um, which I don't know, maybe it was that, maybe it was something completely unrelated. Uh, but yeah, it definitely makes me and, you know, my, my colleagues and my, um, you know, my team more, more and more determined um, to, you know, combat those biases, whether it's about age or, or, or gender. That's great. We've got time for one more question, um, and this is quite interesting for me too. Um, do you think more can be done to encourage high school age girls into the automotive industry? It's such a good question, and it's something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, right now, um, let's take a specific segment of the industry, um, but battery development. There's going to need to be an eightfold increase in the supply of lithium ion batteries to be able to make up for the demand that you know, analysts are foreseeing in the next eight years. Um, there are not enough people graduating with these engineering degrees to be able to make up for the workforce that's going to be required. And so I think it's so important for businesses, large and small, to be getting their name out there, um, to be showing, you know, young females or just young adults of high school age or maybe even, you know, prior to that, um, of what a career path could and would look like within e-mobility, particularly for engineering. Um, so I've spoken to a lot of CEOs. Um, they're obviously more inclined at college age or university age because that's where they feel they're going to see a direct um benefit from that you know if they've spoken to somebody who's graduating within an 18 month or two year period then you know they may be able to poach them um to join their business but I really think it needs to start sooner and it needs to start at an earlier age that's great thank you well thank you very much Samantha we'll see yeah. you again in a couple of minutes for the rest of the panel so just before we bring the panel back together for a final discussion, we have a poll question for you, um, our online audience. So uh, you should be seeing that on your Zoom screen right now. Um, the, the question and the answers for you to select from, the question is, how can female leaders shape the future of EV? And the various answers you can select by marketing products in a way that makes them more appealing to a diverse customer base with different needs and wants or by influencing policies that will accelerate adoption to EVs and make it more accessible, by focusing on making STEM subjects and jobs more inclusive, or by becoming more vocal and visible champions within the industry, or by adopting electric mobility themselves. So in the background, we've got the cogs churning. Please make your selections now and we'll be showing the results in a very short while. 
I've just made my selection there. Hopefully it won't be too long until we can see. Here we go. So leading far and above is by becoming more vocal and visible champions of the industry. Great to see that everybody's so passionate and behind that. And hopefully today's panel will have been uh, working towards that in some way for you as well. So um, now I'd like to reconvene all of our fantastic speakers on our panel today to ask questions of each other. So I'm going to get a bit of a break. <laughs> so I'm going to actually start by coming to Barbara as our panel partner. Could I hand over to you to ask a question of one of your fellow panelists, please? Who would you who would you like to ask a question of? Sure. Thank you, Michelle. Um... I, Samantha, you mentioned something that I found very interesting about how, um, you know, in the process of including diversity and the recruiting is such a key part of it. And there are things that might completely fall under the radar, such as the wording that you use in your job descriptions, the way in you interview. Um, I've read some about that and we actually implemented some of these things here at Wallbox in addition with other things that include, I absolutely need to see at least one qualified candidate that is either female or another diverse background, because obviously diversity is not just a gender thing. Um, I'd love to hear more ideas around that, because I think there's something that anyone who's involved in, in recruiting and, and bringing people into their companies um, should be aware and could um, use some of these. Um, just to make a point here, also completely agree with Kelly in the point that it should really be about the best one gets the job. Um, but if the best one is not even applying to the job to begin with, then we're missing out on the opportunity to having those people um, show up to do their best job. Yeah, absolutely. And Barbara, it's so great to hear that Wallbox are already implementing some of the suggestions. Um, but yeah, I think that a lot of it really comes pre-selection process. So we talked earlier about, you know, it, is that business compelling to a female candidate? Um, are they showing that, you know, there's flexibility with that job description um, as, you know, we're, it's scientifically proven that we're naturally disposed to, you know, not apply for something if we don't fit, feel that we fit all the criteria. But yeah, even are the benefits enticing? Is there opportunity for remote working, flexible hours? You know, we've also worked with a number of businesses that are still building their benefits programs and are sure to, you know, make sure that we're sharing the most competitive plans on the, on, on the market. Um, yeah, co company involvement at colleges, as I already mentioned, but, you know, as some of my female candidates, you know, International Women's Day, International Women's Week, at companies that they're interested in applying to, they're looking at what those companies are posting during those, you know, important days and important weeks. Um, and so, yeah, it's safe to say it's not going to be a good look if there isn't you know active um involvement in in these these sorts of panels these sorts of discussions thanks samantha thank you maria do you have a question for any of your fellow panelists today i do michelle i'd like to i'd like to hear from from kelly from from your point of view um kelly how do you um how do you do, do you feel like you have a role in making sure that the diversity, which is oftentimes well represented at lower level in an organization, but you know, ensuring that that same diversity kind of uh, follows as, as, as uh, people become more senior? How do you work with that in your role? Yeah, I think what we've actually seen is that our CEO a number of years ago committed to a 50-50 um gender diversity at his staff level um, now he's pretty close to that at this point and then that is sifting down through the organization um where we're actually finding it more challenging and some of you have mentioned it you know we're an engineering company for a lot of what we do and with 20 percent of the workforce our uh, engine graduating engineers being women uh it's hard to get to a 50 50 diversity and then if that's how you're um, then driving first time managers and, and things along those lines, you, you struggle a bit more. So we're being very deliberate at it, I would say top down actually. And now looking at it saying, um, how do we get to significant frontline first time managers being women? How do we actually get 
that level of diversity into the organization. Um, you know, I actually encourage my team and I've done it a number of times. I have put women on my staff in individual contributor roles earlier than maybe naturally made sense to give them exposure, to help them see what it's like at the next level from wherever they may be, um, to drive diversity, quite frankly, to drive diversity of thought and background and opinion. Um, and that actually helps accelerate quite a bit. So if you are you know, leading a team or hiring, think about how you actually put somebody on your staff earlier than you normally would. Um, I've done it many times. It actually works quite well. Um, I think it's also a, a, an age thing sometimes is that if, the, if you put some younger people on your staff, it helps people um, have to think differently because people are bringing different ideas to the table, a totally different perspective. So this is where this kind of this in theory risk versus reward, Maria, but I don't ever really see it much as a risk. I just think it's about exposure more than anything an opportunity. That's great. Thanks, Kelly. Swana, do you have a question that you'd like to ask anybody? Yeah, I would like to ask uh, Maria uh, uh, from consulting backgrounds just to understand how um, you've seen attrition in specifically in consulting where, you know, hopefully we've seen a lot of women apply in the lower levels. Yes. But as uh, they start a family, et cetera, et cetera, you see across across the board, not just in consulting, that they look uh, at alternative profiles or stay back at the home, et cetera. Specifically in consulting, how do you uh, tackle attrition uh, because of these reasons? Yeah, it's it's been a real problem historically, as you say. I think I think uh, a bit perversely, perhaps, but I think things like COVID is, has in a way helped with that because we are all working remotely. It's not, you know, long, long hours in the office are no longer and, and women as well as men have find ways of making the, the work and, and the private life balance uh, a bit better. But also from a point of view of, uh, you know, EY specifically, what we do is we, uh, um, you know, we have a lot of people championing not working five days a week, for example, a lot of our partners are working less than five days a week and also um, being flexible around whether you want to start early in the morning or finish uh, later at night. But, you know, so I think we are moving away from that culture that we used to have where, you know, 60 hours a week in the office was kind of the norm. So mm -hmm. um, there are still teams where I think it's, you know, we, we have some more progress to make, but I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. And you're right, it, it has been a real issue. Thanks, Maria. Louise, have you got a question for any of your fellow panellists? I've actually got a question for Kelly, because I think um, you made a point that I really, I guess, resonate with around making sure that you stand for your own values and not forgetting that. And I think that's something that definitely, I think, is, is key. And I'd say, have you got any experience around times where maybe you've had to deal with some quite challenging people or situations and how did you ensure that you kind of were still authentic in yourself and you know manage that situation? So one of the things I tell um, all of my teams um, as I've moved around a number of times in the last couple of years is you are not going to be more important than the team, right? And so an individual for me is not going to sideline the good of the team. Um, and and that is very clearly how I stand. I want everybody to um, show up every day, do the best job that they can. Um, the other thing I always tell people is we all get to choose every single day where we want to be. And if you don't want to be with us or on our mission or you know you have something greater calling you, then do that. But don't make the greater team suffer because you're not doing what you wanna do. And I think that's hard for a lot of people because we all have responsibilities and mortgages and you know all of these things. And so it sounds nice for me to say that, but I very clearly believe it in that I have 4,000 people in the UK and Ireland that I'm making decisions and I'm trying to make the best decisions for the group. Um, and so it's, it's for me, it's about finding that balance, Louise, 
um, which is you have to stand up for yourself as an employee and, and what you want. And I have to make decisions for the greater good. And, and we have to find the balance in that. Yeah, fully agree. Thanks, Kelly. Samantha, have you got a question that you'd like to share? I have a question for Swana. Um, Swana, you've obviously had a really successful career to date, but in particular, having started out in engineering, off the back of you know the discussion around how do we get more female engineers into the working world, I was just curious to understand you know what was your decision making process to uh, towards studying and engineering, and whether you had any particular thoughts on how we could drive that forward. Uh, well, I, I um, did my engineering in India and uh, the strong values come from uh, parents and the family that you are in. And engineering is always given uh, a strong importance um, over any other degree. Maybe right, maybe wrong, but I was lucky enough to fall in a family where, you know, um, I have an elder brother who is also an engineer. So engineering was the thing to do or nothing else. So uh, it was always drilled into my head, do engineering. And um, of course, within engineering, there are multiple disciplines you can choose from. Um, but uh, right from a younger age, I was very interested in mechanics and automotives and cars. And um, when this was offered to me when I was young enough, um, I just grabbed the opportunity. So I think it's, again, to see more and more women doing that will help, uh, you know, uh, my, the younger generation, the next generation say, yes, you can do mechanical engineering. It's fine, totally fine to be a woman and do mechanics. You don't have to just do IT or chemical or anything else. Just to have more people around you who can um, show role modeling again to do um, engineering disciplines which are more male dominated would help a lot. I think people would go into that sector. Yeah, you can't be what you can't see, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You can't be what you can't see, yes. And Kelly, do you have a question for anybody on the panel? I do, actually, Samantha, a couple of um, points to you as both a recruiter, but also as um, maybe a tad younger than a few of us here. Um, I'm really interested in what you're finding both females, but from a generational standpoint, in terms of non-negotiables of what people are wanting moving forward. It's, you know, we recruit a lot of people into our business and I'm really interested in sort of the top couple of things that you would say um, are, you hear overwhelmingly from candidates. Yeah, I think generationally, um, candidates are becoming more and more demanding, which I'm all for. Mm -hmm. um, but things like flexible working, things like culture, uh, the social aspect to, you know, what your company um, can, you know, bring to you in your career, but also on a personal level is so, so important. Um, particularly in the US, unlimited PTO is kind of like a standard um, within the e-mobility industry, which is obviously something that's super, super important, um, you know, across the board, particularly perhaps if you're further along in your career and, um, you know, are starting a family, then that's obviously something that's going to be really important. But yeah, I think that for the, for the younger candidates, that I'm speaking to that are earlier on in, in their career, they are, you know, it's so, so important that they identify with their manager. So um, I've introduced, you know, some amazing candidates to some amazing businesses, but if they don't see it, but that connection is there with that hiring manager, then, you know, I may as well withdraw them from the process. And I'm not saying that's not important um, to a more mature candidate, um, but it's definitely something that I've noticed. Um, and, you know, are they buying in? Can they buy into the values of that organization? And is that organization, you know, outwardly speaking about their vision, mission, and values? Very helpful. So I'm going to ask a question now. I'm going to ask Barbara if you want to come off mute. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who's looking to make a big career change? Um, well, I've done that a few times in my own career, so um, I'll, I'll speak from my own experience, and I hope that's, um, that's valuable. Um, the first thing is focus on the things you can transfer from one area to another, right? Um, and it, sometimes you, we, we look at the things we don't have, and, and women are particularly good at 
doing this or like in, in, in this section, going back to the point I discussed with Samantha, we look at a job description and we're more likely than men to look at the things we don't comply from the requirements of the job and therefore not apply. And men are more likely to look through the requirements and say, well, I have this, I have this, I have this. Well, I have 50, 60, 70%, I'll apply. So the first thing is look for the things in your, in your background that you have that you can see that can work in this different industry or area, functional area that you wanna to go to. Um, network a lot, um, genuinely meet people, attend events, look for places. The one thing I also found in my career is there's so many people that for one reason or another might be willing to um, champion you either because they see the potential in you or because they're looking for someone that has a specific um, experience. So I, I moved from Target, which was a big retailer in the US to Microsoft because they needed someone that knew retail and then had a background in doing business with Latin American countries. And I didn't have the background in technology, which was the category that I was being br brought into to manage, but I was able to make the switch. And then from there, I moved further and further down into technology, which was the thing that I didn't bring with me coming into it. So just look at those things um, and then build those relations network and find people that are that are um, willing to make a bet on you. And I, I think that that's at least how, how to start. Thanks, that's great advice. Well, thank you so much to our panel today for such an insightful discussion. For me, it feels like the time has absolutely flown. Um, it's been wonderful and really inspiring to hear from you all today. And I think everyone in the audience at home can take some real actionable insights away from this to drive forward a more diverse and inclusive EV industry. Now, before we go, I just wanted to remind you to, to look out for the email about the mentoring program. This is an amazing opportunity to learn from some of the female leaders who are shaping and driving forward the industry. So please share it also with your colleagues if you think it's relevant. Now, all there is left to say is thank you once again to our panel. Thank you to you, our audience, for your attendance, for the excellent questions that you've submitted for our speakers and the contributions to our poll. Remember, you can keep up to date with the remainder of Top Women in EV over at the EV Summit's LinkedIn page. And we hope to see you all again at the next EV Summit online series event very soon. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>